Again, my name is Jared Smith. I'm the training manager here at Digium. And uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Michael and Dan for, for great presentations on, on what are the risks and, and the, the threats out there related to voice over IP. And I'd like to go through and, and talk about how you could uh, secure your asterisk-based systems and, and, and make them so that you don't become victim to some of the scams that are going on out there. Um, the goals and objectives of my presentation here, one, understand the security threats and risks that are out there, and then two, talk about kind of the, the concrete things you can do to harden and protect your asterisk systems, and then learn how you can keep up to date and, and keep on top of security developments related to voice over IP and asterisk. I think uh, Dan and, and, and Michael have done a great job of, of enumerating the threats and the risks out there, so I won't spend uh, any more time talking about those, but there are a number of different th threats out there, and you really need to take a holistic view of, of security and network security, um, things like eavesdropping, um, you know, voice over IP uh, phishing or vishing, uh, denial of service attacks, all those sorts of things out there. Um, what I really want to get into in today's presentation is, is four concrete steps that you can take to help protect your asterisk or voice over IP systems. Um, those four steps are one, check for weak accounts. I think that's the number one thing that people are encountering these days is, is, is accounts that people are breaking into to uh, make phone calls on, on your nickel. Um, other things that you can do, number two there, know your dial plan and, and be careful about the way you script your dial plan and we'll go into more detail on that as well here. Um, number three, uh, limit your network exposure. Um, and Dan talked about some of these sorts of things with, with things like VPNs and encryption and things like that, but there's, there, there are concrete steps you can take from an asterisk standpoint to limit your exposure out there on the network. And last but not least, uh, common sense, just keep informed and keep up to date on, on, on the changing landscape. So let's go into a little more detail on some of these. First of all, checking for weak accounts. Again, you know, toll fraud and unintended use of a, of a voice over IP system like Asterisk is probably the most common problem we see today. Um, make sure that your passwords are long and complex. Um, make sure you don't use all numeric passwords. Um, there are a number of kind of third-party add-ons to asterisk frameworks and GUIs and, and that sort of thing that uh, have a bad habit of creating an account with a, a username of 1001 and a password of 1001 and a username of 1002 with a password of 1002. And it should be pretty obvious that uh, that makes it very easy for, for an attacker to guess what your usernames and passwords might be and, and authenticate as that, as that user and, and, and make calls through your system. You may want to um, use what we call access control lists to limit connections to, to certain network addresses or network subnets. Um, an access control list is simply a list of IP addresses or IP subnets where you will allow calls to come from or registrations to come from or, or, or block those as well. And we'll show an example of that here in a minute. Um, the other thing I want to point out on the, on the toll fraud side is just you want to check all your channel drivers, whether you're using the SIP channel driver or the EECS channel driver or H323 or MGCP, whatever um, voice over IP protocol you happen to be using, you want to check all those accounts and make sure that they've, they've all got you know, good, good strong passwords, good, good usernames. And uh, you may want to go audit your, your list of accounts there for any accounts that, that no longer need to be active. Oftentimes, if employees get fired or, or let go for some reason, or if, if you set up accounts for testing and forget to go back in and take those out, you're, uh, you're opening yourself up to, to potential problems there as well. Um, the other thing I want to point out on this slide, uh, check the asterisk manager interface and check those uh, accounts as well. Make sure that those are secured. If someone gets into the asterisk manager interface and has access to those APIs, um, depending on what level of privileges you've given there, they may have access to create new accounts uh, on the fly, change the configuration files of asterisk on the fly, those sorts of things. So that's another thing I strongly recommend that people check. Um, I want to point out just from an architectural standpoint here that when VoIP devices like SIP phones or, or EEX devices um, talk to Asterisk and, and make calls into, into the Asterisk dial plan, they all, always come through what we call a channel driver. So the SIP channel driver, for example, speaks the SIP protocol to 
a SIP device, like Alice's phone in this example, and then translates that into the core of asterisk, and, and, and then Alice's phone would authenticate with the SIP channel driver, and then the SIP channel driver would allow that call to pass on to the dial plan. So again, just, just as, as, a, as a reminder here, um, you want to make sure that the accounts that, that you have in the SIP channel driver configuration are, are strong. So let me give a couple of examples here. Here's, first of all, a bad example of what an account might look like in SIP.conf or eeks.conf, the, the channel driver configuration. Here we have an account with a, with a username of 1001 and a password in the secret field down here of 1001. And the other thing I want to point out here is whenever we have one of these accounts, it points to a particular context. You see the line here that says context equals long underscore distance. That's saying what part of the dial plan should that call come into when, when after the call has been authenticated. In this case, we're, we're giving Alice, if, if, if her phone registered with this username and password, her phone would be able to make long distance calls. A better example of, a, of an account is over on the right-hand side of this slide where we've, we've chosen a, a username that's probably a little bit more difficult to guess. In this case, I've taken the word phone and then a hyphen and then the last six digits of the MAC address of the, the phone itself. Um, you notice my secret's a little bit stronger. I've mixed uh, letters and numbers and, and, and characters and made it 12 or more characters long. Those are all best practices as far as choosing a password. Um, you, you also notice at the bottom of that example that I've added a, an access control list. So I'm saying only allow this phone to connect and make phone calls and authenticate if it's coming from this particular subnet. And this example is a 192.168.55 subnet. The second thing that I talked about on my, on my list of four concrete things that we can do is to know your dial plan. Again, when calls come into the dial plan, they come into different contexts. And you will really need to make sure that you're not allowing callers calling in from the outside to be able to make outbound phone calls through your system uh, without, your, without your knowledge. Um, the best thing you, that you can do to ensure that that's not happening is to draw yourself a map of your, of your dial plan. And, and show where are incoming calls coming into, where are phones that are trusted that, that are authenticating to my system, what context are those coming into, um, and, and make sure that, uh, that you're safe that way. And I'll show an example here on the next slide. A couple other things I want to point out here. Um, be careful what you put in the context called default. Um, when you, when you, if you use the stock configuration files that come with asterisk or use those as, as a uh, base for creating your own asterisk configuration files, by default, the SIP channel driver and the EEX channel driver allow unauthenticated calls into the system to come into this default context. Now, that in and of itself is not a security concern unless you go putting other things in that default context that allow outbound dialing. But I want to make sure people are aware of that so that they don't go placing, for example, a pattern match to allow outbound dialing through a SIP trunk into that default context because then you're allowing anybody to connect to your system without authenticating and then, and then make outbound calls. So again, the best way you can avoid that is to draw yourself a map of your, of your dial plan. And here on this slide, I've got just kind of an example of, of what your dial plan may look like. Um, it may be different than this depending on how you scripted yours. Um, in this case, I have a, a set of different contexts, one called international, one called long distance, and one called local, where I point different phones at to give them different classes of service. So in this case, if I pointed Alice's phone at the long distance context, she could call the long distance context, or it includes the local context. That includes the internal context. And there may be an extension in that internal context that calls to Bob's phone, for example. Um, you can see I've got a, a white cloud at the top, and that may be a my VoIP provider out there on the network, it's sending calls into my from outside context. So I see that calls coming in from the from outside you know, context come into that green box, that from outside context. From there, they can call internal numbers. They could call to Bob directly. But they can't get out to long distance or local calls or international calls. On the far right-hand side, I also show that untrusted callers, again, unauthenticated callers, are going to come into the, the uh, default context over on the far right hand side in the, the red box there. So again, the best thing you can do for your dial plan is just go through your contexts, figure out where they are, 
look at any include statements or any go to statements and figure out you know where where calls can flow through your system and and be careful that way. Um, the third step in my list is to limit your network exposure. Um, a lot of these things have been covered previously, so I won't go into too much detail, but the, the best thing you can do is remove any unneeded modules from your Astro system. Um, if, you, if you were to look at the, the modules that are loaded up in Asterisk, you've probably got between 100 and 150 different modules loaded for various channel drivers, dial plan applications and functions, those sorts of things. Um, specifically, you may want to go in and remove any channel drivers that you're not using. If you're not using the MGCP channel driver or you're not using the H323 channel driver, it's probably a good idea to go into your system, go into the configuration file called modules.conf, and make sure that those modules don't get loaded on your system. Again, just a, a way of limiting your exposure out there on the network. Um, you want to limit the services that run on your Astro system. For a lot of people, um, they'll have Astro running on a box, but then they'll also use it as a web server or as a file server or as a mail server. And I, I strongly recommend that I, against that, especially because Astro often gets deployed outside the firewall um, because some of the ways that uh, SIP and that firewalls uh, interact. I think it's always better to, to have a self-contained Astro server that does, you know, Asterisk and Asterisk only, and and use another server behind the firewall for things like web serving, emails, services, and that, those sorts of things. Um, like I said earlier, we can use access control list to limit connections to a particular network address or subnet. Obviously, from a from a security and eavesdropping standpoint, you can use things like virtual LANs, VPNs, encryption to limit your exposure to eavesdropping or you know, injection of audio, those sorts of things. Another th common thing that people overlook is to keep your configuration files, your log files, and your backups secure. Um, I've, I've seen numerous cases where people were able to um, find other people's usernames and passwords and, and, you know, I and log in as, as someone else, either to get access to voicemail or, or to make calls, simply because backup files were left where anybody could, could get those on the network. So watch out for backups. The last item on my, on, my, on my list of four items was to stay up to date, keep informed, um, keep your Astro system updated. The, the best analogy I can use there is if you were going to, if you were going to go out and, 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 and purchase a horse, you know, you, you'd have to say, okay, do I have, do I have enough land for the horse to, to live on? How, you know, am I going to have food for the horse to eat? Do I have to clean up? A, after the horse, you know, when, anytime you go out and install an Astro server, you should be asking yourself that same port, those, that same set of questions. Um, Asterisk is a living, breathing animal. It needs to be fed. It needs to be taken care of. It needs to be cleaned up after. You have to make sure you keep it updated. It's, uh, there's there's always new new versions of Asterisk coming out. Some of those to address security concerns. Some of those simply to, to fix bugs but it's always a good idea to keep it up to date. The other thing that you should never forget about is that Asterisk is just a piece of software that runs on top of an operating system. Whether that be Linux or Solaris or OS X, you need to make sure that you keep the underlying operating system up to date as well. Um, so make sure you're, you're applying those patches. That may mean that you need to take your PBX down from time to time to apply security updates, reboot the box, and, and bring it back up. That's uh, some, sometimes a hard uh, lesson to learn, especially for people who are used to buying a PBX, putting it in the telco closet, leaving it alone for 10 years, and never having to worry about the software that's running on the PBX. So just remember that Asterisk is just another network service running on your, on your network. You know, update it just as often as you update your web servers and your file servers and your email servers. Two other things I want to point out are a couple of mailing lists that are out there and available to use as resources for or keeping up to date on, on changes to Asterisk and you know, VoIP security in general. And those are the Asterisk security mailing list available at lists.digium.com, as well as the, uh, the VoIP Security Alliance mailing list that Dan talked about, the VoIPsec mailing list. So I strongly encourage people to subscribe to both of those mailing lists and kind of keep abreast of any changes going on with Asterisk and voice over IP security in general.
with that, I'll uh, I will uh, turn the time back over to Steve and and Tristan, and then I think we'll take questions at the end. Very good, Jared. Thank you very much. Um, so that's the uh, the review of how to go about securing your asterisk system. And just to, to put in a very brief plug, we offer a number of uh, training classes, uh, which we'll go into even greater detail than what you just saw from uh, Jared's presentation. Uh, and we'll go through some of those practicalities piece by piece and step by step. So if you're interested, take a look at, uh, at the training classes that Digium has offered. Now.